Well, you guys are stuck with me again this evening. Go ahead and open up your Bible, Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. We're uh, back in the book of Hebrews, sort of making our way through this book. And so before we really get into the lesson, I guess to sort of set the scene again, uh, the, the book of Hebrews written to persecuted people, you know that. Uh, they were thinking about leaving Christianity, going back to their old way of life, uh, going back to Judaism. And so the author of Hebrews, he encourages them, stick with Christ. Stick with Christ, because Christ has something better for you. And, the author, and so the author begins by reminding them that uh, before God spoke to us through the prophets, now God's revelation comes through the Son, the royal Son, Jesus. And then the author encourages them to remain faithful, because Jesus is faithful. Moses is was faithful and he encourages them to remain faithful and don't make the same mistakes that the Israelites made while they were in the wilderness. And then the author moves to talk about how Jesus is this great and merciful high priest and we can approach the throne with a bold frankness because our high priest truly understands. And then after encouraging them to press on to maturity, he explains how Jesus is a greater high priest than what we see in the Old Testament. And so that's sort of where we left off uh, a number of weeks ago, sometime last year. Uh, and, and we pick up uh, this evening in Hebrews chapter 8. And so that's what we're going to cover in the lesson this evening, Hebrews chapter 8. We're going to talk about the main point of this chapter, at least what I think, I guess, is the main point. And then we're going to go on to make application for us and our lives. And so we ask the question, What's the main point of Hebrews chapter 8? Well, the main point of Hebrews chapter 8 is that the new covenant is greater than the old covenant. At least that's what I see. And, I, and we, see it, uh, we see it throughout the context. And so we pick up in, in verse 1. That's where the argument begins. Verse 1. Now the point and what we are saying is this. Uh, and so the preacher here says, all right, here's the point. Here's what I've been leading to. Here's the point of what the sermon is about. Uh, so now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. And so right here at the very beginning, we sort of have this contrast uh, between the high priest in the old covenant and Jesus, our high priest today. If you have to go back to the Old Testament and think, uh, what made the high priest special in the old covenant? I mean, what made them, uh, I guess, uh, more special than the regular priest? Well, what made them special was their proximity to God and the throne. And so one time every year, once in every year, the high priest in the Old Testament would uh, go before God's throne and make petition for the people. That was which day, you guys remember? Day of Atonement, right? That was the Day of Atonement. So once every year, the high priest would go and approach God's throne. And that's really what made the high priest special. They could approach God's throne once every year. And that's the same reason why Jesus is a special high priest. Jesus is a high priest because of his proximity uh, to God's throne. You know, it's interesting. You go back to the Old Testament and you look at Melchizedek. The Old Testament doesn't tell us Melchizedek was a high priest. And I don't think he was. Uh, and so Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. But Jesus is also a high priest because of his proximity to the throne. And how often, how often does Jesus get to approach God's throne? Every day. All the time. Thank you, Miss Mary. Exactly right. Jesus' high priesthood is better than what we see in the Old Testament because he is always before God's throne, making petition for us as his people. And notice that in the Old Testament, the high priest's work was done in the tabernacle, which we're told in this text, it's just a shadow. Uh, the true tabernacle, the true tent is where Jesus is working. But the high priest in the Old Testament didn't get to work in the true tabernacle. Picking up in verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this high priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. And I think that verse is essentially just saying that Jesus could not be a priest according to the law. He wasn't from the tribe of Levi. Uh, verse 5. They serve a copy of 
and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. And so in the old covenant, they had this shadow, but they didn't have the real thing. And the author of Hebrews tells us that as, as a part of the new covenant, we have, and we will have the real thing. And so the new covenant is greater. And this theme is continued in the next uh, section where he starts to quote from Jeremiah. So picking up in verse six, verse six, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent uh, than the old covenant, or excuse me, than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete and what is becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to vanish away. And so the argument that the author of Hebrews is making essentially is the argument of if it ain't broke, then don't fix it. And so the author of Hebrews says the very fact that there is a new covenant teaches us uh, that the old covenant was not perfect. If the old covenant was perfect, uh, God wouldn't have created a new covenant. And so the main point of this chapter is that the new covenant is greater than the old. And this was something that those Christians needed to hear uh, because uh, they were sort of the religious uh, minority, I guess. They were being pressured from all angles to leave Jesus, leave Christianity, leave what was offered them in the old covenant, or excuse me, in the new covenant, and return to the old. And so they were thinking about leaving Jesus going back to the Old Testament. And so they needed to hear, they needed to be reminded that the old covenant is greater or the new covenant, excuse me, is greater. But the question is, is this something that, that we need to be reminded of? You know, while the, while the New Testament uh, Jewish Christians may have struggled with this, I think for the most part, this is something that we get. Uh, this is something that we understand. I mean, how many people in here are thinking, just, I mean, tempt, even a little tempted to leave Christianity and become a Jew? I see no hands, all right? So that's not really where we're struggling. And so the question is, how can we uh, make application uh, of this chapter? How, how can we make application to our lives? Uh, that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time this evening talking about. I want to give you two things. Uh, two things that from the text uh, we can apply to our lives. The two things that we could take away from Hebrews chapter 8. Uh, number one, number one, uh, there's still value for us in the Old Testament. I'm back at the beginning of the chapter now. The beginning of the chapter, verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it was necessary for this high priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are high priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. And so here we see that the Old Testament emblems were a shadow of the current and future uh, true tent, of the current and future true tabernacle. Now let me, I, I, think, that, I think that holds an important lesson for us. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, how many of us 
have seen this true tabernacle where Jesus is working. Anybody? Anybody? Right. We haven't. We haven't seen the true tabernacle. But whenever we look at the Old Testament, we can see shadows. When we look at the Old Testament, we can see its form. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, if I, you know, you know the, the game you play with a flashlight and, you, you know, you make, you know, sh- shapes with, with, with the shadows with your hand. You know, if I, put a, if I put my hand here and shine a flashlight on the wall, and even if you couldn't see my hand, if I do this and you look at the shadow, you see the form of a hand. You might not have every detail of the hand, but you see its shadow. You can see its form. And so there's so much for us to learn, I think, uh, about, about heaven, about where God dwells from the Old Testament. That's not something that we can see today, but we get images in the Old Testament. We get its form in the Old Testament. We get its shadow in the Old Testament. You guys see that? Making, that makes sense? Okay, I just wanted to make sure that made sense. Uh, another, I think, thing that we see uh, in this text and in the book of Hebrews as a whole is that the Old Testament gives us a richer understanding of Jesus. You know, one of the uh, things that we constantly see throughout the book of Hebrews is that uh, the author of Hebrews says, you guys are thinking about falling away, leaving Jesus. Why? Because you don't know enough about Jesus. And so what his goal is, is his goal is to give them a richer understanding, a deeper understanding of Jesus. And in order to do that, he goes to the Old Testament. He teaches them Jesus from the Old Testament. And that's because I believe that the Old Testament gives us a richer understanding of Jesus. Yes, we can learn everything that we need to know about Jesus from the New Testament. But the Old Testament gives us, gives us some more details. I think that's what Jesus says in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, this is before, this is uh, after the resurrection of Jesus, before Jesus is going to ascend into heaven. He, the text tells us that he opens the disciples' minds to understand the scripture. So he meets with the disciples. They think he's a ghost. He says, no, I'm not a ghost. I'm going to prove it to you. Give me some fish. I'll eat it. And so, and so he opens his, their minds after that. Uh, picking up at verse 44, it says, then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And so he's, and so Jesus here says that there are things written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. That's another way. If you like put all those three together, that's another way of just saying the Old Testament. And so uh, in verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, which scriptures? Well, in this context, the Old Testament. And he said to them, thus it is written. And so he says, here's what the scriptures are about. Here's what the Old Testament is about. That Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And so Jesus here tells us that the Old Testament, it's all about him. It's all about him and the work that he was going to do here on earth. And someone may say, well, surely not. No, the Old Testament was about the Israelites and all that stuff. Jesus himself says the Old Testament is all about me. And so if when I read the Old Testament, I don't see Jesus, then I'm just reading it wrong. And so the Old Testament, uh, reading the Old Testament has value for us. Reading the Old Testament, I think it gives us a richer understanding of Jesus. And so I think that's the first point of application that we see here. Uh, The second point of application, second thing that we could take home is that the new covenant is not merely external. It's not just about all of the things that we do. It's, it's about relationship as well. And we see that in the quotation from Jeremiah. And so picking up in verse 8 of Hebrews 8, it says, for he finds fault with them when he says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. And so here we, uh, the prophet Jeremiah, God through the prophet Jeremiah tells the Israelites and tells us ultimately that the new covenant is not going to be like the old covenant. The new covenant is going to be different. But how is it going to be different? Pick up in verse 10. Verse 10. Verse 10, Jeremiah starts explaining exactly what the new covenant is, what it's all about. Verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, 
I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach his neighbor and each one, and, and, excuse me, they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And so this covenant is a, is a different covenant because it's not just going to focus on the external. Uh, this covenant is going to be internalized by the people. In this covenant, the, the, the covenant people will truly have a relationship with God. Uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is the, the new covenant is not just about checking things off the list. It's about truly loving our God and loving one another. It's having that relationship. And you know, this is something that the Jews failed to, to realize. Uh, Aaron and I, we've been going through the book of Isaiah and this is one of the things uh, that we both saw is that the Israelites, they got a lot of the external things right, uh, but they missed the internal. They didn't have a true relationship with God. They didn't truly know him. They didn't truly live like they loved him. Uh, even though they were keeping, they were checking boxes off. They were doing the external things. They didn't have an internal relationship with Jesus. And so Isaiah chapter one, picking up in verse 10, God says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom, and give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. And so uh, Isaiah, God through Isaiah, is essentially telling the Israelites, you guys are worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. You've got some repenting to do. And I almost imagine as we're reading through this, as, as we read through Isaiah chapter one, that the Israelites almost respond by saying something like, wait, how can we be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah? We're doing all the things. We're still offering sacrifices. We're still keeping the feast days. We're still praying to you. And so God responds, picking up in verse 11, uh, verse 11, excuse me. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. Your new moon and your appointed feast my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. And so we see here that the Israelites are doing all the things. They're doing the external things. They're checking uh, boxes off of the list of the covenant keeping stuff. All right. They're saying, say, hey, look, we're keeping the sacrifices. We're keeping all of these feast days. We're doing all of these things. God says, I'm tired of it. Why? Because you don't truly love me. You don't truly, you don't truly mean it. Verse 15, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. The idea is whenever you pray to me, whenever you spread out your hands in prayer, I'm not going to listen to you. And that's what he goes on to say. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Why? Your hands are full of blood. You see, they failed to love God. Uh, they failed to love their neighbor, even though they were doing all of these sort of external things. You know, we talked about this in my Bible class this morning, the book of Hosea. Uh, it's, it's so interesting. The book of Hosea, uh, God describes the Israelites as doing things. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. They were doing the sacrifices. They were still worshiping God, going to church on Sunday, so to speak. They were doing that stuff. But the problem is they were cheating on God. They didn't truly love him because at the same time as they were worshiping God, they're also worshiping idols. See, they failed to internalize their faith. They failed to internalize their religion. I've used this example before. It's like a, a husband who does all the things, sort of checks boxes or a wife, however uh, you want to look at it. Mow the lawn, does the dishes, vacuums, cleans, but they're cheating. They don't truly, they don't truly love their spouse, even though they're checking off boxes. The relationship is not there. God tells us in the book of Hebrews that the new covenant, the new covenant is going to be a covenant where the people truly understand the relationship. They're truly going to love me and one another. It's as Jesus said, what is the greatest command? Oh, love God. The second is like it. Love your neighbor. Uh, and so that's sort of the application for us. We must truly have a relationship with our God. You know, we saw earlier the Israelites are going to church on, you know, Sunday, so to speak. They're worshiping God. They're going to church, but then they forget about God during the rest of the week. Does that sound like us sometimes? Come to church on Sunday and then forget about God for the rest of the week. 
If that's what I'm doing, then I haven't internalized this covenant. I don't have a true relationship with God. And so these are the two applications that we see here. The Old Covenant, the Old Testament, still important for us. And the New Covenant is not merely external. But what I want to do for just a moment is I want to talk about and answer some misconceptions or some questions uh, that could arise from reading this text. And I've got three things, and we'll go, we'll go through them uh, fairly quickly. Uh, the, the first is that the New Covenant is not about the rejection of the Jewish people. You know, some people may be tempted to think that God has abandoned, God doesn't care about the Jews. And that's not what we see from this text at all. As a matter of fact, we look at verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 8. It says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And so the new covenant begins with Israel and extends to the rest of the world. God has not rejected Israel. God has crafted this new covenant with Israel and all of humanity as well. And so that's the first one. That's a misconception uh, or an answer to misconception number one. Uh, Number two is uh, the new covenant doesn't ignore the external. And so we talked about how the new covenant would be internalized. And some believe that means that we could just ignore the external things. We don't have to do anything. Uh, We don't have to do good things for one another. We don't have to come to worship services because it's all about the internal. And that's not true. The external is still important. As a matter of fact, if we truly love God, If the relationship is really there, then we're going to live like it. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, picking up in verse 24, the author says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. If if we truly have a relationship with God, you know what we're going to be doing? Good works. Continuing into uh, verse 25. Not, uh, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. And so we see the external aspects of faith are still important. As a matter of fact, if we ignore the external stuff, then I think it shows we have a, a, an, a, an internal problem. It shows that we truly aren't there with God yet. We, we truly don't have that relationship with God yet. And so that's uh, number two. Uh, number two, uh, the new covenant doesn't, uh, doesn't ignore the external. Number three, the new covenant doesn't give us license to sin. We read in verse 12 where God says uh, in Jeremiah and the author of Hebrews is quoting, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sin no more. And so here Jeremiah tells us that God's going to be merciful. He's not going to remember our sin anymore. And some people say, well, that's okay. Perfect. I can live how I want. It's just license to sin. You know, 007, license to kill. I could just do what I want. And that's not true. Hebrews chapter 12, the author tells us, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Uh, We love our God because he's so forgiving. But we don't use that as an excuse to continue in sin. So that's what Paul says in the book of Romans. Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? May it never be. And I got to be honest with you guys, as I was prepping for this lesson, I really didn't know what to do with this chapter, which is why it took me so long to get back to it. Because as I said earlier, the main point of the chapter is the new covenant is greater. uh, And none of us are thinking about leaving Christianity for Judaism. But, you know, the more I study, the more I realize that there are important lessons in this chapter for us. Uh, This chapter shows us the importance of the old covenant and the awesome nature of the new covenant. Where we have a relationship with God and he is merciful towards us even when we make mistakes. And I think this chapter teaches us that as Christians, we have a lot to be thankful about. That's the lesson. That's the lesson. I'll offer the invitation for you. Thank you for your attention. I hear there's someone here this evening who realizes uh, that they don't have that relationship with God. They haven't entered into that covenant with God. But you want to fix that this evening. If that's what you'd like to do, we'd love to help you with that. Paul talks about putting off the old man, putting on the new. Well, that's exactly what you've got to do. So if if there's someone who wants to do that, we'll help you with that. If there's someone who's left the Lord, want to return, we'd love to help you with that. And finally, if there's someone struggling and wanting prayers and encouragement, we'd love to pray for you. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. If you need to respond to the invitation, you can come now as we stand and as we sing.